But I'm going to talk a little bit about education here. Not, <laughs> it's not all going to be about education. Uh, but, but these are my, my three starting points. First of all, ethics is everywhere today and the enclosure of it in ethics committees in the universities and professional training organisations is symptomatic. Symptomatic both of the attempt to resolve it and the failure to do that. Secondly, that ethics is a field of battle and the very lack of agreement over what the key terms should be in the field of ethics is what marks it as a battleground. And thirdly, ethics is crucial crucial to the way that we link theory and practice. The way that we link theory and practice in what Freud in the 1930s called the impossible professions. Those professions concerned with psychoanalyzing, governing and educating. And we should conceive of those three professions that Freud singles out as including all forms of psychotherapy and counselling, as well as psychoanalysis, political organisation and resistance, as well as government, as Freud meant it, and pedagogy of all kinds. This argument included. So psychoanalysis is included here by Freud as one of the three impossible professions as an indication that simply applying psychoanalysis to the other two, to government and education, will not solve the problem of ethics. We need to do more work on that. So I'm going to explore this question of ethics by first of all mapping out what the battleground looks like at the moment, emphasising that we need to refuse the terms of the debate and reflect on what that motif of refusal entails. I'm then going to look at anti-psychiatry as one form of refusal, focusing on some contradictions in attempts to refuse medical psychiatry, before moving on to look at some similar debates around psychology and what we could call anti-psychology. Then I'll review some key differences of conceptual frame in thinking about ethics as such, the traditional ways of understanding ethics, and look at a little more detail at what psychoanalysis has to say about those differences and I'll end up highlighting the role of critique, external critique from an outside position which is usually the way that we conduct our work in education and imminent critique of ethics and I'll say a little more about what I mean by imminent critique later on. Imminent critique of ethics, of the way that ethics functions today as a signifier, a term linking theory and practice, one that calls for both a kind of psychoanalysis and uh, something we could think of as being anti-psychoanalysis. So let's look at this motif of refusal first. What should we be suspicious about in the field of ethics and how might we begin to refuse the dominant terms of the debate? Now most of what passes for ethics nowadays is so problematic because it's organised by a historically specific set of conceptual grids, competing and overlapping grids that are discursively elaborated within the psi complex. The, the, this term, the psi complex, which appears in the wake of Michel Foucault's analyses of surveillance and confession, in contemporary capitalist society itself operates as a form of critique and refusal. And that term, psi complex, for Foucault and the Foucauldians, characterizes a governmental apparatus and it stands aside from that apparatus, even against that apparatus, to allow us to see how it works, how it functions. The psi complex is a meshwork of theories and practices concerning subjectivity which reduces subjectivity to the individual self so that psychologists can understand it and to assemblages of social relationships so that the self and the social relationships can be categorised and managed, understood by the professionals in the psi complex and adapted to society. This is Foucault, 
one of the photos of Foucault. I'll show you another one later on. So what we see here in this account of the Psi complex is that the self and social relationships are rendered intelligible within the frame of the Psi complex, within the Psi professions such as psychology, psychiatry, psychotherapy, and this Psi complex also includes the interpretative practices that take place today in prisons, personnel departments, welfare services, and of course in schools, and increasingly in schools, as both teachers and children are taught how to speak in a way that will be understandable to the psychologists that see them in those places. Among the many contradictions that riddle the Psi complex, setting its component professions against each other, is a peculiar dialectic which is explored in the work of the Belgian anti-psychologist Jan de Vos. A peculiar dialectic between, on the one hand, psychologization, which renders social phenomena into the discourse of the Psi complex when we're made to speak about our innermost, innermost thoughts and feelings to speak in the way that the psychologists will understand. And de-psychologization, which evacuates subjectivity from our discourse about human behavior and matter and reduces us to our brains, to biological processes, <coughs> which is the thing that is happening more often nowadays. So the psi complex is increasingly powerful as an apparatus, not only as a series of behavioural management devices, but also as a filter through which our understanding of ethics is refracted. It frames what we think of as ethics. Now one of the ways that the psi complex reframes long-standing debates about ethics is conflating ethics with morality. And this is the first important distinction that we need to keep in mind. While morality is concerned with a system of moral codes, <coughs> sets of rules governing how we should live, and images of the self that we should aspire to in order to be able to adhere to those moral codes, <coughs> ethics, on the other hand, Ethics, properly speaking, concerns the reflexive position of the human subject, the way that the human subject takes a reflexive position in relation to the rules or to images of the self. So when this reflexive positioning of the human subject, which is a process, when that reflexive positioning is crystallized, when it's turned into something substantive, it's then transformed from being of the ethical domain into being something moral, something fixed, something we have to abide by. So the Psi complex conflates ethics with morality in two ways, through two conceptual roots. One is when subjectivity is viewed as an integrated substantive thing. That is, when our thoughts and emotions are uh, conceived of as things that can be specified within the apparatus of psychology and psychiatry. When the human subject is treated as an individual, that is, an individual in the sense of being separate from others and of undivided, as whole, as what critical work on the psi complex speaks of as a rational, unitary subject. There's nothing that psychology loves more than the rational, unitary subject. Because then you've got the kind of being that you can fix on and do your experiments and other kinds of research on. And the other route, the other way that morality is conflated with ethics is when this individual is viewed as being bound into a social system dependent on that social system for their sense of personal and community identity. Here, with the community, and this is what is crucial, with the community treated as ideally homogeneous, as rational, and as unitary, as something that can be defined, captured, summed up. 
So the definition of the subject or as psychological thus tends in practice to treat ethics as a form of morality. And this brings us to education. When Freud refers to educating alongside governing and analyzing as three impossible professions, he actually speaks about analysis, psychoanalysis, as if it was a discrete thing that is separated from the others. And that's what immediately makes it impossible. Impossible. You can't do it on its own. And he speaks, with reference to education, about the bringing up of children and about governing, about the government of nations. Education as a field was then, when Freud was writing, contemporaneously with the development of psychoanalysis, and, and even more so today, I think, becoming much more than a practice of the bringing up of children. And in the process, education provided a model for ethics that turned ethics into morality at the very same moment as it reduced immoral subjects to the status of children to be tutored so that they might learn the difference between good and evil. For example, the bequests made by Mrs. Sarah Fielden, of course we're here in the Sarah Fielden lecture, the bequests made by Mrs. Sarah Fielden to support the Department of Education in the Victoria University of Manchester, the training colleges and the field and demonstration schools named after her from 1906 to 1926, also quite explicitly attended to what was called variously moral supervision, moral instruction and moral education. So education thus becomes a field in which ethics always already risks being treated as a moral enterprise. You teach people how to abide by the rules and then you see them as being moral. And the psi complex in education accentuates that danger. In this way, education operates as a fraught resource and a consequence of debates about the nature of ethics. When you educate others about ethics, you will tend to moralize. This doesn't mean, however, that we should necessarily refuse education, you'll be glad to hear. <laughs> and the same applies, for that matter, to government or analysis. Rather, the specific forms of refusal of the psi complex that Michel Foucault's work indicates are finely judged reflexive analyses, deconstructions, we might say, that turn what is progressive about the production of subjectivity, what is liberating about it, against what is reactionary, what is limiting. So even as we formulate the task of imminent critique, that is working inside the terms of the debate to unravel them, to understand how they work, to reflect on them so that we're acting reflexively in an ethical way rather than simply taking them for granted as moral codes. Even when we formulate that task to reflect on what is happening, we risk standing outside those processes we risk slipping into a position where we stand outside pronouncing upon those things from a position of moral superiority. We're always caught in a trap of language, of the dominant forms of language and of the binary oppositions that give language a sensible shape for us so we know how to navigate it. So the simple opposition between what is limiting, for example, and what is liberating in this case could itself lead to a romantic image of refusal as if when we refuse something we're thereby escaping from it, we're free of it, we become free. And one thing that Foucault and deconstruction have in common is that they take seriously the warning that there is no outside of language there is no escape from power and psychoanalysis adds the warning and, and in this respect Foucault is also himself profoundly psychoanalytic against the images of Foucault as being completely against psychoanalysis which isn't true actually Foucault is psychoanalytic in this sense 
Psychoanalysis adds the warning that simple refusal, the idea of some escape or freedom, is not only illusory, but also incited by psychological discourse. One of the deepest ideas of humanist psychology, of course, that you can be free and autonomous, think for yourself absolutely completely without reference to anyone else. When you follow the moral command to be free, you can be sure that you will end up more tightly enmeshed in what you thought you were opposing. And this warning bears on what we're up to when we turn against psychiatry and psychology in the name of anti-psychiatry or anti-psychology. Okay, so now let's turn to anti-psychiatry to see how some of these issues might play out. And this term anti-psychiatry is a term that it has itself been disowned by many of those dubbed anti-psychiatrists. It's a very, very tricky, slippery term, this anti-psychiatry. May be quite right, too. And the exemplary anti-psychiatrist in academic and popular debate, particularly among psychologists, is also someone who refused that label, Thomas Sass. Thomas Sass's refusal, and here he is, Thomas Sass's refusal of medical psychiatry provides a pivotal point of critique which also neatly links together different elements of the psi complex. This is why I'm going to focus on him here. It's a very interesting figure, uh, often portrayed as someone simply giving a critique of psychiatry that is useful for everyone else to use, but actually contains within it a particular political conceptual position that reflects some of the worst things of ethics and the slippage between ethics and morality. His work, which is badly misrepresented in psychology textbooks, is a warning a warning to us as to what happens when we conflate ethics with morality, what happens when we're not careful to distinguish between different notions of ethics, and what happens when we turn critique into psychology. Thomas Sass was trained as a psychiatrist, and his refusal of psychiatry in the classic book The Myth of Mental Illness, which is kind of quoted again and again in psychology essays, was mediated by a right-wing libertarian politics in which his objection to psychiatry was of it as amounting to a form of quackery, fake science. It was tempered, this critique, by his insistence that anyone should be free to choose psychiatry if they wished, but they should not evade personal responsibility by doing so. He was, as he put it, I quote, equally opposed to psychiatric coercions and to psychiatric excuses. It's often missed, this double aspect of his critique. Sass made his objection to left-wing critics of psychiatry very clear in a book published a couple of years before he died, which was called Anti-Psychiatry, Quackery Squared. It's a wonderful book. And the, the differentia specifica of his critique was that each of his colleagues who are portrayed as anti-psychiatrists, did, to varying degrees, rely on free provision of institutional resources, of beds in state welfare facilities, or medication which hadn't been directly or explicitly contracted by someone who willingly took on the position of a patient. So, Sass's argument in that book, uh, on anti-psychiatry quackery squared, for example, was that R.D. Lang, um, had sectioned people, that is compulsorily detained people, uh, patients at some point, that Franco Basaglia, the Italian psychiatrist, had offered overnight stays in the community mental health centres in Trieste. So Sass combined the coercions and excuses sides of his argument against psychiatry and against these figures to reveal that each of these so-called anti-psychiatrists were really, underneath it all, psychiatrists. <laughs> they provide free treatment, they're psychiatrists. They section people, they're psychiatrists. Yeah. Now it's true that each and every leader of currents in the so-called anti-psychiatry movement had first been trained as psychiatrists. 
ranging from Basaglia to R.D. Lang to Felix Guattari, who worked at the Clinic de la Bourg, which administered drug and electroshock treatments while he was co-authoring the book Anti-Oedipus with Gilles Deleuze, to Marius Romer, creator of the Hearing Voices Network, and even to Wolfgang Huber of the Socialist Patient Collective in Heidelberg, whose slogan and manifesto was, turn illness into a weapon. The same applies even to the revolutionary black anti-colonial psychiatrist Franz Fanon in Algeria. The radical and anti-psychiatrists were all trained as psychiatrists, and they remain psychiatrists, Sass argues. And one book which perfectly summarizes the moral political principles at the heart of this conflict between rival traditions in the supposed anti-psychiatry movement that I want to focus on at, at, at some length now is a book called The Ethics of Psychoanalysis. This book by Thomas Suss, which is subtitled The Theory and Method of Autonomous Psychotherapy, first published in 1965, um, is, is a very good account of his uh, arguments. And the popular mistaken representation of Sass in psychology textbooks usually overlooks the fact that in addition to his own psychiatric medical training and employment in the Department of Psychiatry at the Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, he was trained as a psychoanalyst in the Chicago Institute and that this was at the heart of his own practice. But as we will see, it's a very particular kind of psychoanalysis. The ethics of psychoanalysis also exemplifies the way that a version of psychoanalysis that is in tune with the dominant culture can come to operate as a pedagogical instrument that turns ethics into morality. Psychoanalysis is not a medical treatment, Sass declares, but an education. And in this book, Sass characterizes psychoanalysis as a moral exercise, as a moral therapy. And he grounds it in a particular kind of culture, which he then explicitly endorses. It fits with that culture, and he wants to support that culture in the work that he does. So there's a rapid slide from an emphasis on patient choice, which you could in some way see as an ethical dimension, an already very limited notion of ethics, which, as the title of the book promises, rests on autonomous functioning of the individual. There's a slide from that to the idea of a free contract between individuals, which is represented as a moral good. For Sass, this moral position is intimately connected to his politics. Psychoanalysis relies on a contract, he says, between two free agents, the analyst who sells a service and the analysand who buys it. And this buyer-seller metaphor recurs throughout the book, although Sass does not actually treat it as a metaphor. For him, it is a concrete fact about the nature of the society in which psychoanalysis happens. You have buyers and you have sellers. That's how the world is organised. So this fully contractual approach means that the fundamental rule of psychoanalysis for Sass is not free association. You know in psychoanalysis the fundamental technical rule of psychoanalysis is free association in which the analysand or patient says whatever comes into their head, however disgusting or irrelevant or stupid. No, the fundamental rule of psychoanalysis for Sass is not free association and actually he's quite suspicious of it. He says it's a misleading concept. He says it's unnecessary. Perhaps it runs against the ethics of choice because the analysand should decide what they want to reveal about themselves. Free association bypasses that. They can't decide. Instead, the one rule that the analysand must follow is that he pay the fee. So the analyst is in the game to make a living and the analysand has to decide what to make of the service that the analyst offers. And this means, Sus says, this means that the best safeguard is the economic basis of the analytic relationship. And so 
I quote, the financial transaction between analyst and analysand is an integral part of the analysis. And what all this amounts to is a moral claim that the practice of psychoanalysis is, I quote, it's possible, it's possible only in a capitalist society, uh, it's competitive and pluralistic society, and such a society offers a variety of therapies for people in a quandary. Now then, here we're coming close to psychology. He's ending up with a psychological model of the individual as an individual who engages in free choice and contract. So I want to turn to psychology now. This is still sus. We're actually in the domain of psychology, and so we should explicitly locate sus and the question of ethics in recent debates over the nature of psychology, critical psychology, and even anti-psychology. Sus presents a quintessentially psychological version of psychoanalysis. He turns psychoanalysis into psychology. And this is precisely why it then corresponds so well to an educational discourse and a moralizing discourse about the self and social relations. Much of the time in the book and in the rest of his work, Sus describes the contractual nature of the relations between discrete autonomous individuals as a given, and he inveighs against the attempts in the form of the various coercions and excuses, excuses that people make not to make choices, to downplay or obscure these open free relations. This representation of the individual, this representation of the individual as an ideally self-sufficient unit has, along with the critique of communitarian unitary conceptions of the social domain been one of the main concerns of radical psychology and then critical psychology which has developed in and against the host discipline of psychology in recent years. That is, it's been an internal critique that has come closest to what we could characterize as an anti-psychology. An anti-psychology as a repudiation of the depoliticizing psychologizing research and application that is taught in the universities in most psychology departments and is then practiced by psychologists as they diagnose people and adapt people back to their workplaces or to their families so they behave well, become good citizens. When Sass acknowledges that not everyone can afford to undertake psychoanalysis, this is addressed quite peremptorily with a statement that the poor and the uneducated need jobs and money, knowledge and skills. He then goes on in the following paragraph to attack what he calls new psychiatric terms. He really hates community psychiatry, he hates family therapy, and he hates group psychotherapy because they're to do with bringing people together and exploring relationships and questions of what it is to be a subject in relation to others. For him, he sees these as symptoms of an ominous trend in which, I quote, everyone will take care of everyone else, but no one will take care of himself. Towards the end of the book, he quite consistently argues that free psychotherapy would be neither contractual nor, in his terms, analytic. This is an argument that runs against you have to remember this. This is an argument that runs against an often hidden history of psychoanalytic provision in which Freud, for example, explicitly argued for and promoted free therapeutic welfare services through the psychoanalytic training organizations in Austria, Germany and Hungary before the rise of fascism in Europe, before the links between psychoanalysts and left-wing politics were effectively cut in the 1930s, before the links were repressed, we might say. So Sass thus repeats a narrative that's common to many practicing psychoanalysts in private practice today, and cr to critics of psychoanalysis as well, who see the way that it's operating and have very good grounds to be critical, the claim that there's some kind of hierarchy of needs and capabilities 
in which psychoanalysis only figures and should only figure towards the top. You deal with the other things first and then when you reach a comfortable middle class position where you can pay for your treatment, then you can do your psychoanalysis. This is a moral narrative. A moral narrative which is repeated daily in many NHS clinics that use psychological mindedness as a criterion to determine whether a patient is suitable for analytic treatment. This is a criterion which in practice rests on the assumption that the patient should speak or at least begin to speak in the way that the middle class therapist does. This moral narrative also warrants the peculiar and pervasive use of the term poverty in psychoanalytic writing which doesn't mean what you think it would mean. In psychoanalytic writing, poverty is used to refer to internal mental processes. That is, poverty of ability to think, poverty of affect, rather than class inequality. One of the few times in the ethics of psychoanalysis where Sass refers to the weight of history, one of the very few times where he refers to the weight of history, or where he alludes to social structural issues as a background condition for analytic work, is when he acknowledges that it's not the case that any contemporary society can be completely open or free. This, he says, even in the United States, <laughs> that's a shock, where the US Constitution is, he says, our model of the analytic contract. For there are, he says, a few social defects that are undesirable, that should not be left uncorrected. And he puts it like this. Just as the United States inherits the Negro problems from its past, so does psychoanalysis inherit many problems from its medical history. Now this is one of the many moments in the book where a question of social organisation or history is reduced to individual problems. Here, the Negro problems, and reduced to the victim status of those who suffer. And that victim status is surreptitiously reinforced by way of the implication that the victims are in some way the cause Bear in mind here how harshly Sass judges those who use excuses to justify their collusion with what might be seen as coercions. So in the context in which he makes this statement, it's clear that he also sees those who bow to power, the Negro problems, as being responsible in some way, as being complicit in some way. In this case, there are implications that the victims of racism are themselves the Negro problems. A certain kind of moral universe, of contract, of autonomous individuality, thus ideologically blots out an ethical issue that other psychoanalytic writers, such as Franz Fanon, for example, reworked as a political question about pervasive racism inside and outside clinical practice. The underlying conceptual political problem here does not only lie in the slide from ethics to morality, but also in the way that ethics itself is reconfigured in the process. So, along with clarifying the difference between ethics and morality, which I did earlier on, we also need to look very carefully at what is meant by ethics itself. And there are a number of different classical conceptions of ethics, three main discourses of ethics that now lend themselves to the moralizing of behavior and subjectivity. And they function in quite specific ways in different component parts of the psi complex. So if we can map out, if we can map how they work, we could then be in a better position to know how to take up a different relation to them. That is to move from a moral position that they describe to an ethical position as we relate to the way that those rules are formulated. We position ourselves. 
So I'm going to go through the three conceptions of ethics. A first dominant discourse of ethics revolves around the idea of a good as an ideal to which we should aspire. Conceptions of good character and right action have a powerful rhetorical charge in popular discussions of ethics because they seem to tap into what is most profound about each individual human being, whether they're good or evil, whether they're capable of making the right choices in relation to others or even in relation to themselves. And not only this, these conceptions are also potent because they have such a long history in Western culture and can be traced back to the ancient Greeks, specifically to Aristotle. In this discourse of ethics, to be ethical is to be what one is, to act in accord with one's nature. And it's precisely that naturalistic, essentialist notion of what the human being is that has made this Aristotelian ethics the core of traditional medical psychiatric practice. For example, it's one of the discourses that appears in Thomas Suss's book, The Ethics of Psychoanalysis, where he likens the relationship between the patient and the analyst to what he calls the perennial problem between the sexes, in which lovers each want something different. That is, I quote, man, woman, and woman, man. So here, man is man, and woman is woman, with different fixed natures which lead them to want the other sex. That's why this example is so compelling to Suss. This is why it's such a knockdown argument. You see, there's a clear difference between these different natures. Huh? They can't be changed, and it's when something goes awry and someone moves out of their true nature that there's a problem. So it's the psychiatrist as master who knows what the different kinds of deep nature of human beings are, how to guide them to realise that nature, whether to administer treatment to enable them to return to it, to that nature. And in this sense, I would say, Sass too is a psychiatrist. He avoids diagnosis and the imposition of treatment, but there is a thread of Aristotelian psychiatric ethics present in his version of what he calls autonomous psychotherapy. A second kind of ethics emerges with capitalism, effectively as a moral judgment of individual responsibility that is more compatible with capitalism. And so here the focus is not so much on abstract notions of the good, but rather on how it's possible to ensure the happiness of the greatest number of people through the distribution of rights and responsibilities. This is actually an eminently psychological view of the world. Experimental psychology thrives, for example, on the description of forms of behaviour and thinking that best adapt people to enter into commerce with each other and to work to the best of their abilities. This utilitarian ethics, which is elaborated by Jeremy Bentham, he's here, well actually it's just his corpse, in the early 19th century, crystallises the idea that human beings will arrive at the most ethical arrangement of their lives through contract. The contract between buyer and seller is at the heart of this moral order, including, of course, the contract one enters into to sell one's labour power to another for a specific period of time. In place of the idea that there are different beings who work or rule, slaves or masters, here in this world, capitalism, everyone is autonomous, entering into a contract freely and should do so without let or hindrance. And Thomas Sass puts it very well, for example, when he says that contracts are strategies in the service of an enlightened hedonism. I continue the quote, they seek to maximise pleasures and to minimise pains. So it's in this sense that the thread of utilitarian ethics runs through his work, starting and ending with the autonomy of each individual, buying and selling what is necessary for them, and so facilitating the happiness of all. You see, in this way, in this way you can see another sign that Sass, as well as being a psychiatrist, is a psychologist. Third 
discourse of ethics runs alongside those concerned with the Aristotelian good or with Bentamite utilitarianism. And this third discourse is of duty. Duty, which is particularly relevant to psychotherapy as a third component of the psi complex, one which is often competing with psychiatry and psychology. So in place of medical treatment to align us once again with our natural moral nature, and in place of mainstream psychological attempts at behavioural or cognitive modification to enable us to contract relationships with each other more efficiently, psychotherapy tends to emphasise the ability of the person to choose for themselves, and choose they must. Choice is for them to make, aiming not only at options for the self, but for choice that is relevant to the growth of the self. This is a notion of ethics elaborated by Immanuel Kant, a notion which is often interpreted, misinterpreted actually, as entailing a moral trajectory leading from a childish state of non-moral heteronomy. Heteronomy is where we're directed by others to adult moral self-direction or autonomy. So here, cultural enlightenment, that which makes psychotherapy possible as a project, is ideally replicated in each individual's personal enlightenment, so that, as Kant put it in his answer to the question, what is enlightenment, Gesundheit, you have, I quote, the courage to make use of your own understanding. Sass also follows this developmentalist line of argument, claiming, for example, I quote, claiming that small children cannot play contract games. That's one reason he's against child psychotherapy. And he warns that what he calls avoiders in psychotherapy will play the same game as children. The avoiders avoid responsibility and instead they hope to use autonomous psychotherapy to improve their skills in living heteronymously, that is, as directed by others. He hates avoiders. For Kant, as for Sass, this responsibility should not be avoided. It is a categorical imperative. More than a personal ideal or a social convenience, this freedom is a duty. And its form as duty, you must, is more important than any particular content which is ascribed to it. So this mapping of psychiatry, psychology and psychotherapy onto Aristotelian Bentamite and Kantian conceptions of ethics returns us through our critique of them to ethics as such. That is, it returns us to a position through which we are able to act ethically in relation to those moral codes. We can treat each of them not as a moral framework, but as a set of questions about how we should act, including how we should act in relation to those frameworks. So it's that different relation to a moral system or to a series of moral demands that we could refer to as being properly ethical. Okay, so let's come now to psychoanalysis. The relation to a moral system of any kind is precisely what psychoanalysis is concerned with. But psychoanalysis is not one thing and it operates both inside the psych complex and outside it. Psychoanalysis is, to borrow the Scottish term, out with, out with the psych complex. The psych complex refracts various discourses of ethics through morality, morality which comprises both a particular ideological vision of what the social order is as a moral order, and through moral injunctions that you should be or should do this or should be that, to be a properly moral being. Psychoanalysis enables us to grasp the nature of those moral injunctions as if they operated as a categorical imperative in Kantian terms, to understand what is at stake in the distribution and allocation of costs and benefits that Bentham advocates, and to understand the role that ideals play in an Aristotelian recommendation of the good. And we can see elements 
of each of these three ethical discourses at work in Freud's writing, described by him and unraveled. Ideals of all kinds are at the heart of Freud's account of how we model our ego on that of others who are significant to us, those we directly identify with or those that we set ourselves against. Freud's exploration of the role of civilization in permitting and obstructing the realization of the drives requires an understanding of what we are contracting when we enter a social world of any kind. And Freud alludes more than once to the superego as an instance, as a command that operates as if it were a categorical imperative in Kantian terms. So this poses an ethical choice for us about what we do with psychoanalysis. One way of working with these descriptions is to treat them as given. Psychoanalysis then turns into a normative moral system and psychoanalytic treatment would indeed then operate as what Sass calls moral therapy. So when we're told that, told by Sass, that Freud created a unique instrument for exploring the human condition and for enlarging personal freedom, this is true as far as it goes, but it doesn't go so far as to ask how this personal freedom operates in the life of the analysand, the patient, how it operates as a moral good, as an opportunity for social contract, or as a moral imperative, or as a super-egoic injunction, you must be free. This is also why Sass explicitly reformulates the aim of the analytic work, so that it's no longer to help the patient gain access to his unconscious, as he puts it, itself rather a problematic formulation of psychoanalysis, but rather, he argues, the analytic enterprise should be seen in terms of communications, rule following and game, game playing. Another way of working with these moral descriptions in ethical discourse is to refuse them, not simply to reject them outright, but to appreciate how they work, appreciate them all the better to unravel them, to traverse them. That would be a radical psychoanalytic response to these issues. How is it, for example, that what is assumed to be the good of one master or the good of a community can function as something horrifically dictatorial or oppressive for others? How is it that the attempt to balance costs and benefits of a distributive system might turn out to establish the rule from one determinate position that is always included when it pretends to be neutral and disinterested? How could it be that dutiful obedience to a moral law could result in forms of subjection that are even more destructive for the subject? So I come to the last uh, section on critique. And here, again, we have Foucault, but this time Foucault with hair. <laughs> so instead of a moral position or a use of ethics to reinforce moral codes, Psychoanalysis is reflexive ethical critique of those codes. Instead of external critique which stands above what it describes, psychoanalytic critique is imminent critique. The point is that only imminent critique of the discourse of ethics can itself be ethical because any and every supposed external standpoint, one which pretends to provide an external critique, is actually implicated in what it describes. These are not abstract questions, for they define how we will act as analysts or analysands working in the tracks of the psi complex, an apparatus that routinely misrepresents what subjectivity is and what it could be to its practitioners and to all of us. Ethics requires imminent critique of the psi complex, one which takes the concern with subjectivity seriously without subjecting ourselves to the terms in which psychiatry, psychology, or psychotherapy describes us. This conception of ethics calls for imminent critique of education as a pedagogical practice, which interrogates what learning is rather than repeating that education is a good, a means to learn how to sell our labour power or a duty to which we should conform. It calls for imminent critique of the psychotherapy registration organisations that latch onto ethics as a signifier of the good at one moment as a code of ethics to try and resolve the contradictions in their own practice 
and that the next has a version of what they now, in the UKCP for example, call virtue ethics, which turns back again to notions of good character. This authentically psychoanalytic understanding of ethics, which I'm counterposing to Thomas Suss's psychiatric, psychological and psychotherapeutic arguments, calls for a critique which attends to the particularities of the position assumed by the subject in relation to language and to the political stakes of an indeterminate open field of choices that characterise democratic politics. And it calls for imminent critique of psychoanalysis itself as a theoretical framework that is less than a century and a half old and which, in its development, reflects the moral presuppositions of its host society, even at the very moment that it tries to escape those moral presuppositions. Perhaps Sass is right to say that psychoanalysis is ideally suited to capitalism. But then that raises a question about both, how we might refuse the conditions of possibility for psychoanalysis and capitalism, how we might look forward to the end of both of them, using psychoanalysis tactically and reflexively as imminent critique. Is not psychoanalysis as such, is it not just one name for radical, deconstructive, imminent critique which dissolves its own status as a thing separated from education and politics and other spheres of human activity? All this also connects us with Foucault and the critique of the psychomplex as an apparatus which locks us in place and makes us talk about how we feel about that. So to end with the question of application of psychoanalysis that I began with, we need to refuse to apply psychoanalysis because that application is itself an indication that we're thereby in the domain of exterior critique. How we refuse, as well as what we refuse, needs to be seen as an ethical process, interminable, unravelling, of what we face in the clinic and in everyday life about what is to be done. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. It's time for some questions. We'd like to kick us off. More discussion points? Oh, no. <laughs> What says saying that uh, it seems like the primary principle is that the analysis must fail. Uh, I, I cannot see, I mean, I'm quite outraged by that. So, I mean, I cannot see how that kind of trend comes about. I, I mean, especially, uh, like, I mean, if you were to look at the Freudian corpus rather than object relations, I think object relations would be quite easy to, like, bring back together that the that the patient must pay in object relations. And so that just brings me to the point that I feel that it's not the analyst who must pay, it's the analyst who must be paid. I mean, for the, like, you know, just to turn the gaze not on the analyst, mm. but on the analyst. Mm. And what kind of, and that is what psychoanalysis, I mean, you know, that this is to actually try to accommodate Sass's point. But by looking at it in the other direction, yeah. is that why is it that the analyst must be paid to be able to do work at all? Yeah, that, that would be one way of turning it around. I, I think you're quite right that it goes against that whole tradition of psychoanalysis around the time that Freud was writing, the first generation of psychoanalysts, but it is in tune with the kind of psychoanalysis that took root in the United States. Um, and to which many psychoanalysts had to adapt when they fled from Nazism in Europe and arrived in the United States in a culture in which payment was absolutely central to the way that people understood their relation to the social. And so many psychoanalysts, for example, who had already been medically trained in Europe, had to undergo medical training again in the United States. That was one way that they became adapted to US American society in the 1940s and 1950s. But the, the other key way was in this, um, this agreement that they had to 
adopt because they were so frightened of being kicked out of the United States, especially under the impact of McCarthyism in, in, uh, later on after the Second World War. Um, and that adaptation to the idea that there's a contract between the buyer and the seller, and this becomes central. And it fits very well with a, a, a notion of psychoanalysis that took root in the United States uh, through the 1950s and 1960s in what it was, became known as ego psychology. That the aim of psychoanalysis was simply not only to enlarge the sphere of freedom, as Suss puts it in his book, but actually to increase the power of the ego as a rational organizing uh, center of, of decision making, how to engage in contracts with others. Um, okay, so you could, you could turn it around and you could say, shift attention from the analysand paying to the analyst being paid. But you could go further than that and you could say, no, the issue is not so much that the analyst should be paid, but the analyst themselves should pay. Huh? That the analyst themselves needs to think of their activity as something which gives of themselves in the, in the practice of psychoanalysis, so that they are um, engaged in the social bond in a, in a deeper way, rather than simply receiving a payment for their activities. Uh, and I think turning it around in that way, further from what you suggested, to say that there's something that the analyst must do as part of the activity, rather than simply receive goods, um, might start to open up the question which was explored by Freud and his followers in the early years of the 20th century over and over again, a question of you know, what the psychoanalyst is doing and what their desire is in their practice, why it is that they engage in this impossible profession that, that isn't going to bring immediate benefits Very interesting. And uh, one thing I, I mean, somebody who's not a psychoanalyst or from this field, that was very interesting for me is how uh, the insights of SAT can be <coughs> taken to almost any other expertise to make similar arguments about how any expert need to be paid. Um, so, in a sense, what we do in university is we sell our expertise, and therefore we become dependent on the same relationship. You can say the same about economists, you can say the yes. same about yes. experts of various fields who create some sort of a product. Um, what, and they don't necessarily have to be paid money. They can be paid in other forms of capital as well. Um, so the same, um, the same dependency of an expert on, on some sort of an exchange <coughs> is an inter integral problem. I think that's one thing. So then the question would be, how is psychoanalysis different? The second thing to consider is uh, the walk of, uh, I forgot the names, Akrif and Schiller, I think, uh, the two economists who just won two years ago, I think, uh, the, um, what's it called, the, the Nobel Prize, yes. Um, and the, the, the core argument is that the, in the basis of every interaction, uh, of every exchange, every commercial exchange, is the inequality of knowledge that the seller can essentially manipulate the buyer to buy everything, anything they want, because they have so much more information than buyers. Um, and in that sense, we can take this further to ask about any kind of expertise and how we sell, how experts sell their expertise. Hmm. Um, which leads us again to the question of why psychoanalysis is different. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. And, and there's a, there is a, there's a deep, deeper connection between the arguments that I'm making here and some of the arguments that have been made inside and against psychotherapy. Uh, people like Richard House and Nick Totten, um, who've argued the basic problem in the regulation of psychotherapists and the basic problem in the uh, reduction of psychotherapy to some kind of contract in which the, 
the Anadazan imagines that they're buying something which will allow them to be more productive and successful, you know, when they go back to work. The underlying problem is professionalization. It's a professionalization, insidious professionalization, that divides those who have knowledge from those they sell the knowledge to, and divides the different professionals from each other as we can see in the relationship between psychiatry, psychotherapy and psychology where there are turf wars between different kinds of professionals who desperately want to claim that their particular idea about the human subject is better than the others. Yeah? These kind of divisions, segregation, segregation of consumers from, 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 from those who provide services and, and, and segregation of the, of the professionals from each other is, 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 is at the heart of the problem here, I think. And, and to understand that professionalization, you need to have an account of the development of capitalism, <laughs> the way in which capital is understood as a good a moral good. You have to accumulate capital and if it's not going to be actual capital then it needs to be cultural capital so that you know uh, I give a talk like this so I can put it on my CV and you know even though I'm not going to get paid for it then I can take that somewhere else and cash it in at some point. Or social capital where I use my networks and exploit my friends so that I can you know uh, make use of the shared expertise that we have in order to set up my own business eventually. Yeah. Manuel, please. I actually have two questions. One is theoretical, the other one is pragmatic. Practical. So the first one has to do with uh, being the, the, the fact that one cannot escape language, obviously, as, as you mentioned. As I mentioned. Uh, so when we make a, a critique to psychology or psychologization, such as, for example, John de Vos has done in his book, yeah. uh, the thing one needs to use uh, the language of psychology, or in his case, or in your case, I would argue psychoanalysis. So the question is concretely, is it, is, it, um, is it possible in any way to make a critique to psychology without using psychological or psychoanalytic, psychoanalytical language, uh, or not? And the practical or pragmatic question has to do with professionalization, which was brought up. Uh, so if if the way these uh, professional psychologists, psychiatrists, psychotherapists, and, and psychoanalysts, even though it's not, that, I mean, they are professionalized in their own institutions, uh, is done through education, through, through higher education. Uh, so I guess this is a question about uh, to, to make a link with political language about the revolution or reformism. So is it what, what should we do with psychology uh, or with the side discipline? If it's like the critique is the purpose of the critique is to argue that they are iatrogenic or they should be replaced or, or, or disappear, or should we re, or should we reform training in some way? Yeah. Although this may be a trap, just to try to reform here, you know, modify curriculums, for example, to make students make more, be more reflexive about the ethical role or the moral roles. Yeah, it, this is a very tricky. Uh, practical, pragmatic argument. So I, I was wondering if you have any yeah. uh, thoughts on that. Yeah. Okay. That 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 they're two very difficult questions, um, and and I, I I think with respect to language, um, the, the 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 argument I was making was that you can't escape language. You can't escape the binary divisions that enable us to m map our way in language and to engage in debate and every time we engage in debate we reinforce those binary oppositions um, but we can find a way of tackling those terms that structure how we think and how we relate to each other in order to question how those terms operate so to in deconstructive terms it would be to put those terms under erasure. That is to continue using the terms, but to understand the historical weight that they have and the work that they're doing, and to open up the contradictions in those terms so that they don't have one substantive fixed meaning, but they, 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 they become more fluid and, and, and open. Now to, to do that kind of work, you need more time than is usually allowed in either uh, academic sessions and certainly in the soundbite politics that we have in the media.
Hmm? That's why that soundbite politics is so pernicious and dangerous, because you must come up with a quick answer and you must use the terms in an immediate way in which we know what each of the terms means. You don't have, you have, don't have the space to, 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 to the question them. And I would say that um, psychoanalysis can operate in that kind of way in relation to psychology. Psychoanalysis is dangerous to psychology because psychoanalysis is concerned with a different notion of the human subject, of a human subject that is divided between conscious and unconscious and is divided at the level of the unconscious them, them itself so that um, psychoanalysis threatens the psychological notion of the rational unitary subject. I would say that psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis as a notion of subjectivity threatens psychology, it threatens psychiatry in, in the form that Sass is concerned with, psychiatry, and, and also the alternative that Sass puts forward, and it threatens psychotherapy as well because it doesn't promise that there is a happy ending where someone becomes integrated and whole and they're completely able to understand what they're what they're feeling and what they're thinking, unite everything into one, one you know, wholesome uni unity. Psychoanalysis opens up that other sphere of subjectivity which is more uncertain and contradictory, endlessly uncertain and con contradictory. In psychology, that psychoanalysis is sometimes reduced into a form of psychology, a model of personality, for example. And I think that's why um, uh, Erica, for example, in her book, uh, Deconstructing Developmental Psychology, uh, calls psychoanalysis the repressed other of psychology. You know, how is it that all of the past links between psychoanalysis and psychology, ranging from Vygotsky being a member of the Russian Psychoanalytical Society to Jean Piaget being a member of the International Psychoanalytical Association practicing as a psychoanalyst, how is it that those things are erased from the psychology textbooks? Hmm? There, it's the repressed other and it returns, it's a return of the repressed. As soon as psychologists start to take psychoanalysis seriously, they land themselves in a series of uh, contradictions and questions which they find difficult to contain. And I think our task in relation to psychology and the emergence, the re-emergence of psychoanalytic debate in psychology is to, is to intensify that confusion and contradiction on the part of the psychologists. Once they land themselves into that field, on that terrain that they, don't, that they can't control, and to use psychoanalysis to open up the certainties of psychology. Um, yeah, question about professionalization. Maybe, maybe, you know, is 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 linked to that as well. It's about how to um, how to use the psychoanalysis as a tool which opens up professional practice. I'm thinking, for example, of the work of Tom Billington in Sheffield, um, who has described how he uses uh, educational categorization devices. Uh, in schools or with parents or with children, um, tactically. You know, the danger is when you use those tools to define what the subject is and you really believe in what you're doing. You sell a moral good to your client, rather to use it tactically to do certain kinds of things. The best educational psychologists are the ones who use it in that kind of way. to carry on what you were talking about, but returning to some of the earlier questions about, uh, um, I was thinking of an example of, of uh, reversing the, the sort of payment relationship between the psychoanalyst and Malazan in the case of, well, what happens when that happens, when that happens, uh, with Wolf Sachs in South Africa. So uh, this is a man, a psychoanalyst in the 1930s, the 1930s, wasn't it, South Africa, who, um, who, who, uh, who wanted, he, he wanted to know about the, the psychology and mental life and uh, psychoanalysis, uh, psychoanalytic processes in, amongst black people. He was, a, he was a Jewish, white Jewish, European, emigre, 
um, no, was it, he might have been South African born even, I can't remember, but he was white. Uh, uh, no, he was an emigre. He was an yes. emigre, yeah. right. And he, and so he, what happened, uh, obviously he, he, he couldn't ask a black man, a black person to pay for psychoanalysis, so he, he offered free psychoanalysis, but that free psychoanalysis turned out effectively that him not only effectively paying in his analysis and in various ways, but becoming involved in his struggles, way outside the psychoanalytic consulting room, into all the all the, the all the issues of oppression uh, and persecution happening to him and his family. So, in a sense, that 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 throws up some quite interesting questions about what's so safe about the abstract exchange value of money, because it avoids the sort of questions of involvement and connection to other places. And once you take that away, or tr transform that in, into some more material form of, of giving and exchange, um, then other things happen. Um, and so I wanted to sort of invite you to take that a bit further in terms of the you know, the refusal process that you talked about it as a, you know, in, um, not only about psychology and psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, but also education. And what might that mean for um, a, a, a radical edu or critical educational practice? <laughs> so that it is about that. It isn't moralizing or pedagogical. Yes, I want to add to that, yeah. yeah. Well, if it helps to answer this, yeah. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I mean, just to carry that forward, it is that uh, if, um, for instance, to work when uh, without the notion of payment, why would that stop any kind of work from happening, like any psychic work from happening in the classroom or in the clinic? I like, and I cannot find that in psychoanalysis itself. That I mean, certainly one relation to money. You, like one that is a it, it becomes perhaps a way of working on something so your money doesn't perhaps stand for itself the payment doesn't stand for itself but for something that psychoanalysis is trying to trying to gesture at but uh, if there is if this is removed this symbol is removed cannot like can't work anyways happen so I oh yes so then, like yes. this entire thing about, like, I mean, the connection between capitalism and, uh, I mean, like, it feels like, I mean, if you bring in, like, notion of the psychic economy, it, it complicates that. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, I, I, just first on that, um, I don't think that the link between capitalism and psychoanalysis is a question of is, is only a question of contractual relations where someone pays and someone sells. That's the way that Sass understands it when he celebrates capitalism as the perfect context through which to do psychoanalysis. That's why he sees the US Constitution as so wonderful because he sees uh, he's it a defining what a capitalist society is. He sees the United States as the place where you can do psychoanalysis. Relations is 80% British, so you know to say it's American. I, and I think no, I didn't say object relations. But object relations really does develop this as well. <laughs> yeah, okay, yes. So you're yes. Not only the yes, and not only American, <laughs> but I'm saying in the case. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 We'll deal with we'll deal with object relations later. Okay. But um, the, the 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 point here is around Sass and the way that he fits so well with American society uh, and with American capitalism is that I don't think that that's the link. That's the crucial link. I think the link actually is in the development of capitalism. You have a laboring subject who is exploited and alienated from their labor, alienated from other people as they compete for labor in order to be able to work because they need, they need the money to, they need to, to get the money to be able to work and feed their families. Alienated from their own creativity as they produce things for their employer. There's a split between the activity of producing and what they produce, because what they produce is owned by the, by the employer. Alienated from their own nature, um, 
because uh, they have to treat their body as a machine that takes them to work every day um, and alienated from nature as such because nature becomes conceived as something threatening and, and uh, uh, rebellious and out of their control and they must be in control. It's that alienation under capitalism, I think, I would say, it's that alienation that capitalism entails that gives rise to the psychoanalytic subject. That is a kind of subject in which there is an unconscious. There is a subject in which we are divided from what we think and there's a whole domain of our experience that we can't access, that we've repressed. I would say that's the, his that's the historical link. That's the linkage that I would make. So not the linkage that Sass thinks that there is. His is an ideological linkage of a very uh, specific kind. In terms of payment of the uh, analysand, this also had been going on for years and years in the development of psychoanalysis and after Freud died actually in the International uh, Psychoanalytic Association. The classic case which is uh, um, teased over time and time again by the psychoanalysts in training is the case of the Wolfman. Now the Wolfman under, un underwent uh, another tranche of uh, analysis after his analysis with Freud um, big to, to clear up some of the problems that had been caused by his analysis with Freud, I would say. Um, and uh, he even then was in a pretty dire state uh, for the rest of his life and he was paid. He was paid by Freud at different points in the analysis because he, he, was, he was destitute at different, different times, Russian, Russian emigre that he was, and he was paid a stipend by the International Psychoanalytical Association until he died. And some claim that it was to shut him up, you know, because he'd start moaning about how bad the analysis was and how it, you know, it, it made him worse. Huh? But, but another way you could look at it, a more generous way that you could look at it, was that there was some responsibility and link that had been made between the Wolfman and the psychoanalytic organizations that, that, that needed to be um, honored. And you see many, many uh, 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 incidences of that. And it's in, it's in keeping with Freud's support for the free psychotherapy clinics, with Freud's lecture in 1999 in Budapest, where he was absolutely explicit that with the possible development of what free welfare services in Hungary in the wake of the possible um, uh, Hungarian revolution which was brewing at that time and which was eventually crushed, um, that, that, that psychoanalysis should be free, absolutely free. No, you don't need contract or payment to do psychoanalysis. Yeah. So, so y yes, you, you, you can take it further but you need to take it further through the history, historical engagement with psychoanalysis. Uh, I think, and uh, retrieving that lost history, lost history that is described so well in El Elizabeth Danto's book, Freud's Free Clinics. It runs absolutely against everything that SUS stands for. Which also had educational activities. Sorry, I didn't ask your question about education. Maybe you could... <laughs> Which includes education, of course, <laughs> as you say. <laughs> <laughs> Just to say, again, thank you very much to Ian for that, you know, incredible, fascinating. I don't know if you're aware that your namesake is a blues guitarist and singer. <laughs> I, I looked you up on Google. Oh, there is, there is, there is, there's also another Ian Parker, a journalist, who wrote a wonderful um, paper, which you can find on the internet, called Absolute PowerPoint, which is about the way that PowerPoint restricts and contains and manages subjectivity of managers. But your blues guitarist namesake, his latest album is called Politic Blues. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, you like Politic Complex. Uh, I don't know. I'm going for a sound bite here, but if we don't, <laughs> no, well, try to be. fight away. <laughs> but regardless, thank you very much, Ian. That was absolutely fascinating. And uh, thanks for your questions as well. Thanks. <laughs>